My name is uh, Lisa Skumetz, I'm from Boulder, Colorado, but I'm a Midwesterner by, by grow, growing up in Heartland, Wisconsin. I know Corny Heartland. In any case, <laughs> it's really the name of the town, and uh, Airhead Warhawks go, okay. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit on evaluation, because I think that's really an important step that we don't always do, and I'm walking your way. Um, and then I'll talk about outreach and marketing and the traditional methods and then enhanced methods. I think it improve what we're doing in the kinds of outreach and marketing that we're doing. And finally, for me, it's not evaluation, it's not assessment, it's not really planning unless we put our results in context. A number alone is not very useful. A number compared to something else, that becomes useful. And that's what I want to talk about last. So evaluation to me is about guiding program decisions um, and, and since we're dealing with public funds in many cases, I think dealing with public funds responsibility is part of our job as, as both partly haulers, but especially as program managers at cities, counties, state level, etc. And I'm not going to take credit for that sort of definition or that guideline, but, but that's really what Nobel winning economists have, have reported and I'm or have put forward, and I'm a strong believer in that. Um, uh, to, to figure out what works, we, I think. Yes, it's useful to look at times, but unless we really look at cost effectiveness also, we're not really doing our full job. And, and so we need to look at that. It gets, gets towards real measurement of impacts and costs. And also, what would have happened without the program? And try to net that out as well. That's sort of another level that you see it as I come up. The question is, can we do that for marketing and outreach? How many people have actually measured the impacts of education programs? And you go to the literature in recycling, and it's paltry, say, that to, to be kind, it's non-existent to be probably more more honest. Um, we don't know whether whether it has a measurable effect. We have no idea whether it's cost effective or not. We also don't know if it lasts, and that's part of the whole cost effectiveness issue. You know, you make it and use the funds to you know educate people. If it only lasts a month, those are pretty costly times. If they last a year, less costly. If they last a change in lifestyle, I mean that's that's less costly still, so even better. So we really need to look at that. And, before we can consider education and marketing as part of a, a real portfolio, for portfolio we offer for recycling, we really need to know this kind of stuff or it's not, it, it really can't compete with some of the other programs that we have, at least not long term. So an impact and cost analysis of what, what's needed for cost effectiveness. So to do that, I did this analysis. You don't need to read the things up at the top quite yet, but I will explain them to you. And I have, And so what I did was I tried to do an impact evaluation. And I said, OK, what do we get if we you know, get getting data from hundreds of communities around the country? What do I see for impacts on both the tonnage and the cost for recycling companies who make various changes? And those various changes include things like pay to throw, going to single stream, um, changing the frequency of collection, changing the days of collection, you know, whether or not uh, we have mandates or bans, and that sort of stuff. So we looked at a whole host of things that people could have been doing. And then we looked for two things. This measure, this axis measures how much more tonnage it, you get or how much more costly it becomes. And um, this is, of course, all the different measures. So what you really want to find is you want to home in on those options that cause you the biggest blue and, and green bars, which mean more recycling and more your, uh, composting organic, so green being that way. And in my scale here, red means cost. And also, this gold, there were very few gold ones. That was the cost of a yard waste program, but we didn't have very many, very much information there. So what, if you were looking for your ideal program, you'd go, give me the tallest blue bar and the negative red bar, because that means I'm getting more for less. Or a really short red bar, which means I'm getting more for not much more cost, right? So that's what we did. And what we came up with was, if you're really looking for what's cost effective, what are the things we have to do, what are the big bang four items um, in recycling, they're these things. And they correspond to those little arrows that were pointing down on that graph. The things we care about are Paisy Pro. One of the, it was the single biggest blue bar we had on the graph. So if you want to impact what's happening in your program, you want to do Paisy Pro because it's highly impactful in both trash and recycling, in recycling and um, yard waste diversion and source reduction. And it's extremely cost effective. The tons are, not only is it cost effective, but other people pay for it. It's self-funding. So, wow, okay, so that's, that's one thing you want to do. Another thing is really look at the frequency of your collection. Every other week collection is far more cost effective in many cases, and what we found 
is that yes, you know, you get more tons by collecting recyclables every week. All right, you do, but you don't get enough more tons to correspond to the fact that it's you can save forty percent by going every other week. For that, because you're reducing the number of stops that you're making, and it's all the cost is pretty much all of the stops, right? So you reduce the number of stops you've got by going to every week. You dramatically cut your costs. And the better thing to do is actually to implement, say, a yard waste program with that, that missing stop. You get a whole new stream, and you get it for essentially the cost of your recycling program. Very little extra. Best program of all, go to every other week trash, go to weekly yard waste mixed with food waste, and every other week recycle. That would be your ideal program, cost-effective and diversion-wise. If you're looking for what's cost-effective, what will move diversion forward? These are the things that, it, that we're finding. Single stream, I know people think it's heresy and you get crappy material and all these other sorts of things, but the bottom line is you get a, you get a lot more participation. You get on the order of three to five percentage points, up to 40% more, more recycling from households by going to single stream. That's a lot of tons to ignore. And you get it, you know, if your, if your purview is collection and murfing, then, then it's less costly. If your collection, if your perspective is also mills, well, if mills need clean materials, mills need to pay more for cleaner materials. Or the incentives are not going to go back down the line. And anybody who runs them, work, public or private, should not invest more in making more clean material until they're rewarded for it. The ROIs aren't there, the long-term economics aren't there. It's crazy to not be offering more. Um, if it's a problem, if clean materials are a problem, Cleaner materials, whether they come from single stream or dual stream facilities, have to be rewarded with more money. So anyway, in any case, single stream gets you way more materials, and it also turns out to be one of the things that really opens the door for commercial recycling. Commercial entities cannot, you know, they're already strapped for space for dumpsters, or whatever. They can't have four more dumpsters for four different sets of materials, or even two more dumpsters in many cases. They can have a single stream, you know. Bin for small for small businesses or dumpster for, for bigger businesses. It's a real problem to ask them to sort it into multiple streams. They can't they can't make that happen. So it really opened the door on commercial stream as well. And I'm not here as an advocate for single stream. I especially do, um, get irked when people say single stream equals dump bad material. There's good there there's good single stream material, bad single stream material, good dual stream, bad dual stream. It's about how you operate, how you manage how you educate in the first place. So in any case, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm just looking at the numbers. And what the numbers tell me are single stream gets you a lot more material for lower cost. And that's that's what really that's long-term sustainability to me. So okay, uh, mandates and bans. There is nothing that gets you more times more cheaply than installing a bunch of mandates and bans. Now, I know that's hard to completely and I, it's it's a big problem, but if you want to get even you, know, you can get a, get a set of programs that everybody agrees to. You do a comprehensive plan, you get a, a stable group together, and they all chat about what programs they want. They look at the numbers and they all say, oh, I think we should do education, I think we should do some incentives, and I think we should do a couple of other things, you know? Bottom line is if you put mandates and bans in there instead, you'll get 11 to 30 times more tons for the same dollars spent by the community. I mean, if you're going to spend some political capital, get a program set, um, set programs in place, it really ought to be mandates and bans in there because well, that's, that's a core part. It's there's just nothing that produces. I've been in the business, I know I didn't start out this way, but now I've been in the business for you know 30, 30 X years. And the the more I'm in the business, the more the more I see people fiddle around the edges instead of changing the system. And changing the system is the easiest way and the fastest way is mandates and bans. So then the other thing, um, let's talk about marketing and education, that's the rest of my talk. And the question is, where does that fall in diversion? Where does that fall in cost savings? So traditional theory set for marketing and outreach says people you move people from unaware to aware to considering to intent to purchase or change their behavior to actually purchasing or modifying their behavior. Well, I put a little asterisk next to the actual purchasing and whatever their behavior because um, in a lot of cases it's it's really intent where a lot of the educate the um, stuff stops. They'll do surveys or they'll do focus groups to figure out what their intent to buy is, but the actual measurement of whether or not people actually change their behavior has been kind of thinner than, than the intent of research. But in any case, this kind of model let people think about you know product awareness to intent as, as the way to go, but it really missed the the if 
influences that you can have on behavior um, through other kinds of, of outreach, specialized outreach. But I did want to say that we did conduct research on factors that would help increase and make things more, more effective, that um, I actually mentioned that. So what we did was we say, let's start with what the traditional, the impact received the traditional education outreach. We didn't find much research, so we kindly one of uh, the neighboring states, Iowa, um, um, we won a grant there. We analyzed 120 um, outreach and education campaigns in recycling, and from nationwide, and then oversampling in Iowa. And we were able to, you know, there are no places that do no education. So it's not like you're measuring no education versus education. You're talking about a, gr a gradation of more education. We did find some elasticities. We found that one, adding one dollar per household per year on, uh, for education got you between one and three percentage points more diversion. That's elasticity. And when you got, and so, and you got only one percent diversion if your town was already spending a whole bunch of money. And you got three percent if your town was spending very little. So it's not, you know, made, made some rational sense. But the bottom line is it did only get you, you know, up to three percentage points. And there was little, we had no way of measuring what the um, long-lasting impact of that was. So we knew that was a difference, but we didn't know what, you know, how long that, that impact lasted. And so the question to me was, one, well, where does, how does that perform, how does that show up on that set of graphs I had before? And then second, can we do better than that? So here's how it showed up on the graphs. And the bottom line is, you were looking at those high blue bars and, and low red bar, or negative red bars. We get a short blue bar and a higher red bar. So not the direction we really want. And it doesn't make education look like, traditional education look like the best thing to be throwing our money at, given how well we can do by making some of these other kinds of changes. It's not to say, you know, you don't do education. Everybody needs education. You need to know where the drop-off center is. You need to know whatever. But is there something we can do beyond the kind of informational-based education we've been doing that makes us perform a little bit better? So how do we make education more um, effective? There are three things I want to talk about in particular, and those three things um, are, one, let's talk, let's look at what, what drives people, what motivates people. Self-efficacy is sort of a feeling of empowerment that some people have versus what other people have. What I do makes a difference, regardless of whether my neighbor does it too. That would be a high self-efficacy sort of um, uh, score or, or feeling. And here, it's this, this um, picture that one of my staffers found which sort of illustrates it. How bad could the environment in throwing away one plastic bottle be? 30 million people wonder. You know, any that it's sort of where you where, how how you feel about that statement is sort of tells you a little bit about how you how what, how well you are um, in terms of self-efficacy. We found that the people that have these feelings of what I do makes a difference regardless, they participate more in, in recycling and, and energy programs, they conserve more energy, they recycle 11 percent more, at least based on some studies that we did in um, Utah, and we've done a bunch of work in, in schools and other kinds of programs to show that those people who have self-efficacy scores that are higher and have that greater feeling, they, they make more green behaviors. So the bottom line is don't just talk about in, you know, education and information, but talk about how I locally can make a difference how I locally can have an effect on the environment with, um, and move people who are close to being self, having high scores to getting high scores, move them and give them practical things that they can do about local actions to encourage empowerment. Next thing is look at the fact that people don't just buy recycling because, you know, for recycling only. There are effects beyond tons that are attributed to the program. What they get is not only recycling. They're, they're, I, I, the easiest way to describe this is actually think about um, uh, um, say the energy field. So when people get their home weatherized, it's not only about saving energy, it's about getting greater comfort. It's about things like that. So it's kind of making that connection in the recycling field. We've done a few studies that have shown that in the commercial side, there were things like aesthetics in the building, there were, there were, um, do, there was doing good, there were productivity increases, there was greater access, a bunch of other things that came from recycling programs that actually were in some cases more valuable to the business and we've done some work on the, on the energy or, or residential field side as well.